Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Hoy. The Psychology Talk podcast is a unique conversation about psychology from around the globe. We bring you ideas from mental health practitioners and experts to keep you informed about the latest issues and trends. Topics include developments and research in psychotherapy and social sciences, hypnosis and mind-body treatments, meditation and spirituality, and new treatment modalities. And while you're listening, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a review at your favorite streaming site. It helps us to grow and further reach people with quality programming. And now, here's the episode. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, my guest is Dr. Matthew McKay. Dr. McKay is a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. He has authored and co-authored numerous books, including Self-Esteem, The Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook, Thoughts and Feelings, and ACT, or ACT, on Life, Not on Anger. His books combined have sold more than 4 million copies. He's received his PhD in clinical psychology, and that was at the California School of Professional Psychology. He specializes in cognitive behavioral treatment of anxiety and depression. Dr. McKay is here to discuss two new books he has co-authored, Super Simple CBT, Six Skills to Improve Your Mood in Minutes, and the Healing Emotional Pain Workbook. Dr. McKay, welcome to the show. Good to be with you, Scott. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Well, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and um, how you got into CBT. I, I, you're, you are kind of a, a a big name in the CBT pond, especially with the relaxation uh, and stress reduction workbook. That's a classic. Well, I, I got into CBT in grad school. I uh, had a mentor there who um, taught CBT and really introduced me to the, to the concepts and, um, and it made truthfully just made so much more sense to me than psychodynamic work. Uh, I'd, I'd been in psychodynamic work. I'd been psychoanalysis myself, and I found it had not been particularly helpful. On the other hand, CBT, which uh, encouraged me to look at my thoughts and how the thought my thoughts impacted my emotions, uh, made a big difference in my life. So I found it personally useful, um, and uh, and so as I began to use the techniques. Uh, in my own life, with my own emotions, uh, I began to really deeply believe in them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was it was personal experience and and seeing how that would play out in the consulting room. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that that you didn't entirely abandon some psychodynamic ideas, but not in the the way things play out in the consulting room. Well, I think uh, for me the the psychodynamic emphasis on, on the relationship and, and on transference on the, on how a, the client will project their experiences of, uh, with uh, early, early relationships in their life onto the therapist and so forth. And, and the therapist analyzes that. I, I found that to be, uh, to frankly kind of indirect. Um, and I wanted to help people change their lives now, as opposed to, you know, work on how they were misperceiving people uh, in in their current life based on old relationships. It's not that that can't be helpful. It's just that I was more oriented toward focusing on um, changing how people behave in the present moment. What 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 can we do differently to make life better? Both in terms of what can we do differently in terms of our thinking. Mm-hmm. And what can we do differently in terms of our actual responses and behavior? Okay. All right. Yeah. I, no, I get that. I think, and I think, I think CBT has influenced psychodynamic uh, therapist heavily. And, you know, uh, I think it's a lot more straightforward and, and, and directive than it used to be. Yeah. I think, I think that they had a, I think it's had a, a good influence on it in that sense. And I think that psychodynamic therapy and theory has a lot to offer CBT. I mean, I think there's been a, an interface in terms of schema work where psychodynamic uh, thoughts about ideas about um, pathogenic beliefs 
uh, and how uh, they affect us and in, not just influence our behavior, but our emotions. And that <clears throat> we try, try to defend against that pain uh, using cl- classic mecha- mechanisms to protect us. All of that, I think, has a lot of value. And I think about it a lot with my clients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the books that you have coming out. I mean, Super mm-hmm. Simple CBT came out a couple months ago and then the Healing Workbook came out recently. Maybe you can you can add upon uh, what we're discussing here and, and, and how that plays out in these two uh, uh, self-help books. Well, in a way, they're, they're bookends, uh, to, to make a bad pun, because uh, Super Simple CBT is, is, is the classic approach uh, to psychotherapy that was you know, developed by Aaron Beck and others uh, in the early 70s. And um, <clears throat> the, the idea of, of CBT and, and what we're trying to help people do in Super Simple CBT is to recognize that their thoughts uh, do have a big impact on how they feel. And, and first of all, just, just to learn to listen to your thinking, to be aware of your patterns of thinking and, and ultimately to, to take that awareness into uh, and use that awareness to make changes in how you think. I mean, I mean, for example, you know, one of the things that, you know, we talk about are, are, uh, these these uh, patterns of limited thinking, and this comes right out of Aaron Beck. You know things like filtering, where you only look at the negative and you don't you don't look at positive aspects of experience. So, you know, filtering is one of them. Another one is polarized thinking, where you l- see everything kind of in black and white, di- very dichotomous. Um, <clears throat> if you're a student, if you don't get an A, it's as good a B is as good as an F because there's nothing in between uh, utter failure and and complete success. Um, you know, patterns like overgeneralization, where uh, instead of being rec- recognizing that something happens some of the time or a problem occurs at certain intervals or in certain situations, it's, it happens always. It's always happening. Or, or I, ne- I never get what I need. And everything is very, very um, extreme. And, 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 and one of the things that Beck and others realized was that when we do thinking like that, uh, it tends to stir up a lot of anxiety and depression. And, uh, and so that's, again, just another example of these kinds of, of patterns that we were looking at. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, one which is another pattern, for example, is mind reading, where we tend to assume that we know what the other person is doing. And we remember a minute ago, we were talking about transference in psychodynamic work. Uh, where the where the the client assumes that they know what is going on with the therapist, and they they project a lot of things on the therapist based on their own ideas about themselves and, and old, old relationships. Well, th- we do that a lot, and 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 in CBT we took, call it mind reading, and it's this it's this idea that we're uh, we project our own ideas about things onto other people. So uh, these are just examples of what. Aaron Beck called cognitive distortions. What we talk about is kind of patterns of limited thinking. And, and, and when we learn how to change those patterns, it turns out uh, that oftentimes some of the chronically painful emotions that we struggle with uh, get better. And, uh, and we feel less depression, less anxiety and more well being. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, working with patients, uh, I, I see that the semantics of what people do with their language can be very limiting. And and what you just what you've done by sort of reframing the term cognitive distortion into patterns of limited thinking is nice and elegant, and it's a nice way to. There's a kind of shame or disgust with the idea of distorted thinking or illogical thinking, right? Like. Um, I think you can get into a pattern with people who are already experiencing a lot of shame, your clients, your patients, uh, where they, they, they start to heap shame or guilt upon themselves for having these limited, this, these limited thoughts. Right. I think uh, that, yeah. you're absolutely right. 
And, you know, with all due respect to Dr. Beck, who just passed away at age 100, uh, I have to, I have to agree that uh, it's, it's pejorative to talk about these things as cognitive distortions. Um, And, and these ways of thinking uh, in many cases grow from really important and authentic early experiences in life. Uh, And, you know, we learn how to think, we learn how to relate to, to problems and stresses uh, from, from, from our parents, from other models that we have. Um, and we develop these patterns and it's not that you know, characterizing them as irrational uh, or, or, or distorted uh, is really unfair. And I think what, what we have is that, we, you know, we have ways of thinking and understanding the world uh, that sometimes get us in trouble. And I think that, I think that that is, a, it's just, it, it's just a more um, accepting and supportive way of thinking about uh, cognitive problems. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I totally agree. Um, I think that that having, I, I think that what's nice about about both of these books is they have more of a a gentle focus to them. Right. And, and the super simple, simple CBT book itself is a very elegant, you know, concise version of, of other books from my understanding that are out there. Like I won't name, you know, there's some classics in the field and there's others that are upcoming, but, but what, what was it that you and your co-authors kind of, um, what was the impetus for making this book for, for structuring a, a very concise, small, easily readable and digestible volume? Well, over the last uh, 50 years, CBT has become a very elaborate treatment with complex um, protocols, you know, multi-step protocols. Of how, how do we treat anxiety, certain kinds of anxiety? How do we treat certain kinds of depression? And all, uh, many, many disorders have, for those many disorders, uh, researchers have developed these these complex multi-step protocols. And, and we wanted to kind of strip away some of that and get down to back to its essence essentially, uh, which is um, <clears throat> learning how to observe one's own thinking processes, noticing how thoughts impact emotions, just, just one, you know, just recognizing that uh, certain kinds of thoughts, certain kinds of patterns of thinking do impact how we feel they, and, and start, you know, people starting to see the linkage between, Oh, I'm having these kinds of self attacking thoughts uh, and self judgment thoughts. And Oh my God, I can see the sense of shame and, and, and or depression rising inside of me and just starting to see those, those relationships. And, and that's a huge part of CBD is just recognizing that, you know, what you're thinking is, is affecting your well-being and and how you feel. And so we wanted to kind of get back to some of these very simple but profound concepts um, and and to help people begin to evaluate, um, is their thinking leading them to feel happy or creating a sense of well-being or is, is their thinking pushing them into these dark emotional corners? So that was really, uh, we wanted to get, you know, kind of t- t- take things back down to the basic and most, uh, I-, I think, most useful level. And, um, of course, CBT is is not just about uh, looking at our thoughts and, and, and in some cases doing cognitive restructuring, uh, uh, learning how to change how we think in order to change how we feel. CBT involves other things, too. It involves, for example... Uh, stress uh, reduction, which is a huge issue. I mean, we live in a society with unprecedented levels of, of stress, and <clears throat> and that stress is uh, impacting physical health uh, and and functioning on all. And certainly, the stress is impacting our relationships, and and we're seeing that uh, in this age of COVID uh, exploding in some way the, the the stress level, and so CBT offers a, a whole suite of of fairly, you know, 
easy to implement um, ways of relaxing the body and reducing physical stress, which, which is, uh, it turns out to be, you know, crucial for a lot of people. You know, I have clients, you know, learn three or four different, you know, simple stress reduction techniques and I have them set their smartphone. Uh, so, so, so it goes off every hour, just a little bit beeps. And at that moment they spend 30 seconds just taking their stress level down using very, very simple processes. And, and it makes a big difference. For one thing, when your stress goes down, you're not as, as likely to think anxious, concerning thoughts. I mean, your, your body's more relaxed. And so your mind isn't, isn't reacting to this sense of danger and, um, uh, and, th- and threat. So um, again, CBT offers more than just, you know, we can work with your thoughts. We can work with your body. We can, we can help you uh, feel uh, a level of, uh, we, we, you know, we, we all live at a certain level of, uh, uh, you know, stress or, um, and, 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 and once that level of stress goes over a certain threshold, we start having symptoms. We start having significant anxiety symptoms and to get that level of stress back down, that that chronic level of stress back down under that critical threshold can make an enormous difference in people's lives. Yeah. Well, I, I, if I'm correct in, in looking at some of the statistics, I think it was in 2019, I was kind of alarmed to see 18% of adults in America identified as having, enough symptomology that would give them at least generalized anxiety, if not, you know, panic disorder. So, or social anxiety. So 18% of the population is kind of an epidemic, but that's grown significantly since the pandemic started. So I think it's closer to 20 or 22 to 25% now. I mean, that's a quarter of the population with, with, you know, it probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how statistically reliable it is to say that everybody has a diagnosis of anxiety, but they're certainly suffering from significant amounts of anxiety. So you're right. Those, those tools, say, for instance, in the stress reduction workbook that you, you authored many years ago, uh, they're just so helpful to people to be able to just bring that baseline level of stress down like hypnotherapy or just relaxation training, breathing, mindfulness, all of those very helpful tools that can be integrated into therapy are are immensely, immensely helpful. Yeah. And that, and that they're often simple to implement. I think that's uh, what has struck me is that um, sometimes you can, you can learn a, a relaxation tool that takes you, three or four or five minutes to learn. And if you just implement it regularly, uh, you could make a big difference in your life. So sometimes things uh, are not hard. Uh, and um, and I'm, I'm struck by what you were saying, Scott, that, you know, we're talking about uh, probably approaching a quarter of the population of the United States is, is facing uh, anxiety levels that are clinical, that are, that are actually di- diagnosable. I mean, that's, that's an enormous amount of suffering. And, and, and one of the things I think that was, uh, we were hoping for with this book is that, you know, sometimes if I think people don't, don't have the tools, they don't know what to do with the pain that they're in. They, and, you know, and, and they, they don't, maybe they don't have access to psychotherapy. They don't have the, the resources to pay for it, or they, don't have insurance or, or they can't find a therapist and, um, and they just have no idea what they can do with this uh, constant chronic level of, 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 Ill, of, di- of dis-ease, of, of feeling that something is wrong, a constant sense, sense of threat and danger. And, and they don't know what to do. And yet there are, there are really specific tools to help them in both in terms of how they, how they're thinking and looking at their problems, but also what they can do to relax their body. So yeah, that, that was, that was the idea we wanted to, you know, a lot of people just don't have access to these tools and they don't necessarily have to go to psychotherapy to get them. They can get them uh, oftentimes in a self-help book. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, 
I, one thing that, that struck me is, is it's a term I have, I've, I've seen a little bit of lately, but I, forgive me for not, not being a no, but you can enlighten me in the audience is you, um, you call this, the second book you, we, that I mentioned uh, the healing emotional pain workbook. It's process oriented CBT approach. What's the difference between that and like say classic uh, CBT? Yeah. And that's why I was saying their bookends because uh, this is sort of the latest iteration or latest version of CBT that um, comes out of after 50 years of evolving. And remember I said a few minutes ago that, you know, what CBT did over the years is come up with these elaborate protocols for treating disorders, you know, so, you know, whatever the problem was, let's say you were struggling with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, there was an elaborate multi-step process to help you. And, and every single diagnosable problem uh, had, had its own, set of processes, its own um, uh, set of steps that uh, that the therapist would take with the client. But the problem was that it was a, it was based on symptoms. We were treating symptoms um, and it was one size fits all. So if you showed up with a certain diagnosis with certain kinds of symptoms, then, okay, here's the treatment. And, um, And so it wasn't personalized. It wasn't uh, tailored to the particular needs of a particular person. And what we've discovered in the last, you know, 15 or 20 years is that, is that treating diagnoses, treating symptoms is really not uh, very effective or it's not as effective as if we were actually treating the causes of the disorder, you know? So so let's, let's, that that reminds me, I mean, like, I think that, uh, one of the big debates that the medical system, because we're a part of the medical system as psychotherapists and behavioral health specialists, we have to use, you know, the the protocol diagnosing and treatment and finding the right treatment for the specific diagnosis. But the outcome studies don't point to any correlation or very little correlation between proper diagnosis per whichever version of the DSM you're using and outcome. I mean, obviously, you're going to be in the ballpark some way with, with treating two basic things, depression and anxiety in, in most cases. But, but I think what you're talking to is the fact that you're not looking at the root causes. That's you know? right. Yeah. And, and so you're personalizing it, which is what, what filters down through a good therapist is being able to personalize the treatment uh, in, in a way that's helpful whatever the modality it is to that individual. And, and the book does a really good job, I think, of do, uh, parsing that out. Yeah. So uh, you're right. Um, we, we've been treating disorders uh, and that, that show up in what's called the DSM, the diagnostic and statistical manual. And I know you're familiar with it. Uh, all, all therapists have to use it to diagnose in order to get, um, uh, insurance reimbursement, but it turns out that what you're saying is absolutely right in my understanding, in my view, that there's very little relationship between the diagnosis and effective treatment, and and it's and the and the reason for that is a, a bucket of symptoms, which really is what a diagnosis is. It's just a group of symptoms, uh, doesn't really lead us and get us very far in terms of knowing how to help that person. What we really need to know is what actually is driving the, dis- the problem, the disorder. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that, you know, uh, depression and anxiety co-occur about 60% of the time. And here are these very different disorders. And in the DSM, they have very different looking s- symptomology. And yet, how come they show up 60% of the time? And the answer is that they're driven by many common elements, what we call mechanisms. Uh, and now the, the term that is used a lot now is transdiagnostic mechanisms. These are mechanisms that, and, or factors that actually cause the problem, the depression or anxiety, um, for this particular individual. And, and now that we're starting to understand what those mechanisms are, uh, and we're actually able to measure them, 
uh, we can make treatments instead of just about a diagnosis or a, a, a group of symptoms that may or may not really lead us very far in terms of knowing what to do for that person. We can now target these mechanisms. And so for an example, some of the mechanisms that we see in common for anxiety and depression are things like uh, rumination, um, emotional avoidance, trying to, to get away from what one's emotions, uh, cognitive avoidance, trying to, trying to push away th- certain kinds of thoughts, um, a behavioral inactivation, a, a deactivation, not, not being able to uh, engage with life in certain ways. And uh, I'm just giving you these as, as examples. These are mechanisms. These are, these, are, these are things that we now understand are underlying uh, certain cases of anxiety and depression. And when we can identify a particular client's cluster, their own unique cluster of mechanisms that are driving their problem, their disorder, uh, now, now we're in a position to actually dr- directly treat why they're anxious why they're depressed and what's maintaining that. So that's, so that's the difference. I mean, we're now, we're now, instead of treating symptoms in process-based CBT, we're treating the mechanisms that actually drive and create these, these symptoms. And from, you know, research tells us that at this moment, anyway, that we've identified 11 mechanisms that, that we think are responsible for most emotional disorders. And the word process now where that comes in is okay. Yeah, we have a mechanism. This is the thing that we think causes a disorder. I mean, let, let's say um, the mechanism is emotional avoidance. A yeah, person just doesn't want to go near anything painful, and they, they really work hard to avoid uh, any kind of di- distressing emotion. Um, and that might seem like a good idea, except that it turns out that emotional avoidance is uh, a very uh, highly re- correlated with uh, both anxiety and depression and, and various kinds of anxiety and depression. So trying to avoid emotions actually tends to make them worse. So, you know, just saying, okay, let, let's say a particular individual um, scores high in emotional avoidance. Well, that tells us that now we, we need to target that. And what we use is change processes. So it, the process-based CBT it, are the change processes that we're going to use to target that particular problem. So for example, with emotional avoidance, one of the change processes we use is emotion exposure, which involves, um, and this is something that's very familiar to psychodynamic therapists as well. It involves holding, uh, making room for emotions, observing them mindfully, um, noticing the moment in which you're, you might be tempted or driven to a particular emotion driven behavior and noticing that, uh, you have some choices about that. So observing emotions and what they t- want to make us do, learning to see that and watch that and not necessarily act on those impulses is a huge part of, of recovering from some of the psychological problems that our clients face. Um, so that's just an example of a mechanism, emotion avoidance, and a change process that targets directly that mechanism. And it makes a big difference with, that we can actually see what's causing the problem for this particular person. And, with, and then we can design a particular uh, change process that's specific for them and, the, and, their, and their problem. Well, maybe, and, and with that, maybe you can kind of discuss, because, you know, I, I have a copy of the book. I'm actually kind of, as, as we mentioned earlier, I'm kind of working through it, giving myself a bit of a, of a tune-up, if you will. <laughs> And enjoying it, but maybe you can describe, you know, what the process of using the book is, so that the people out there who might be interested in picking it up uh, or might gain interest would, would would understand how to use it. Okay, it does well. It starts out. The book starts out with a um, well, it kind of describes, you know, what process based CBT is. That you know, there are these mechanisms that cause problems, as we said. And then there are change processes so that we can target those mechanisms. And uh, the very next section of the book is uh, something called the Comprehensive Coping Inventory 55. And, it's, and, it, and it measures these 11 mechanisms. <clears throat> the mechanism, I'm going to tell you what they are. They're, they're behavioral avoidance. Trying, trying to, and that's mostly 
relating to depression because it's it's a, avoiding um, engagement with life, um, and, you know, disengagement, withdrawal from life it measures that. And then the second one is safety seeking, which is mostly about anxiety. It's about uh, avoiding things that scare us and various strategies for avoiding things that scare us. But of course, the more we avoid things that scare us, the more afraid we become, which is the sad paradox of anxiety. Uh, then there's emotion driven behavior, which is, uh, you know, doing the things that our emotions tell us to do. And, and what we have found clinically and in research is that when you do the thing an emotion drives you to do, it makes the emotion worse. So for example, if you're depressed and the emotion dr drives you to withdraw, that makes the depression worse. If you're anxious and, and the emotion drives you to, um, to avoid things that scare you, you never learn to tolerate those things and you become more and more afraid and your life becomes more and more constricted. So again, when, and if, for example, with anger, that drives you to be aggressive. And it turns out that the more aggressive we are, the more angry we become. Uh, the, and that there's a kind of a reciprocal relationship between aggressive behavior and increased emotion of anger. So when we act on our emotions, they tend to get worse. And, and that's something that, uh, again, we want to notice because if, 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 if an individual is acting on their emotions a lot, that's emotion driven behavior and we can measure that and we can treat it. We, we, there are processes that can change that. Mm -hmm. Another process is distress intolerance is, which is the idea that, you know, when things are uncomfortable, we're having distressing emotions or distressing and difficult, challenging events that we're facing, dealing with, um, that, Distress intolerance is the belief, I can't deal with that. I can't handle it. It's too much for me. And it's also the, 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 the awareness that I don't have the resources to deal with this distress. And so it results in, again, a lot of avoidance. So distress intolerance is another mechanism that we look at. Thought avoidance. I can't think this. And we see this a lot with trauma. I have a trauma clinic in Berkeley, a PTSD clinic. And, you know, so many folks who suffer from trauma are trying to get away from the memories, trying to get away from thoughts associated with the trauma. And, the, and then it turns out the more they try to get away from those thoughts and memories, the more intense they have, they become, the more flashbacks they have, the more um, uh, arousal and, and uh, alarm states that they have to endure. Um, so PTSD symptoms actually get worse when we try to avoid certain memories and thoughts. Um, and of course, another one is cognitive misappraisals, which is, uh, you know, we actually were talking about that a few minutes ago with Aaron Beck and his, uh, uh, what he called distortions, but uh, cognitive misappraisals are uh, a significant, have a significant impact on all kinds of anxiety and depressive disorders. Um, and we can treat that. Another one is self-blame, uh, which is also called internalizing. And it's the tendency that anything that goes wrong, any stress I have, any problems I have, it's all my fault. I'm bad. I'm screwed up. And those kinds of self-judgment thoughts are very powerful and very influential in depression. Um, and then blaming others, which is also called externalizing. Uh, that's another mechanism. It's like all my stress, my pain, my struggle. That's somebody did this to me. Somebody else is responsible for this. And of course, the problem with externalizing is, because we always decide that somebody else is responsible. Uh, we don't have any agency or control over the problem. So we're waiting for somebody else to fix it, for them to stop doing whatever they're doing or stop, start doing something that we want them to do. And so our focus is all on them changing and we're helpless and do, can do nothing to change and deal with our own pain. So, you know, that blaming others. And there's just two more. One is worry, which is we're, we're all very familiar with. Uh, which has a lot to do with anxiety, but worry also occurs in depression as well, where we start visualizing a very dangerous and difficult future. And, and we start feeling pretty depressed in the present moment because the future looks bleak. And finally, rumination, which is highly correlated with both anxiety and depression. Uh, and, um, and rumination is just about thinking, why is this happening? Why do I feel this way? What's wrong? How did, how did this occur? So a lot of why thoughts and, 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 and kind of weaving some sort of narrative about, you know, how, how things came to be the way they are. Um, 
and uh, and usually a lot of negative thinking as well. Like uh, you know, you know, uh, this I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do. Uh, think, think I'm out of control, and so forth. So these are the eleven mechanisms that are that research tells us are most responsible for emotional disorders. And, and no, but the thing is that not everybody has all these mechanisms. In fact, no, nobody has all these mechanisms. Um, and so it's, the important thing is to find out well which mechanisms do I have, and which of these strategies of coping with stress. Basically, these are all these mechanisms are maladaptive strategies of coping with stress. And which ones am I using? A lot. And those are the ones that I need help with. And those, and there are specific processes that can help me overcome those old mechanisms, those old maladaptive coping strategies. Yeah. Well, it, it, it the, you, yeah. Thank you for that. And, and, and the explanation of those and, and basically, after you do the rating, from what I'm gathering from it and having worked through it a bit myself, is that you do that rating and then you find the highest one, two, or three, or however many uh, you score on. Yeah. Uh, and then you work on those top areas as your main thrust of uh, those chapters that are relevant to, say, rumination or blaming or self-blame. Or exactly. Else. Instead of the old way that we had with with protocols where okay now you you're anxious so now here's the seven step protocol and the, and you, it's a one size fits all everybody does the same thing this is very different it's like let's find out for you in particular which mechanisms which which drivers for your anxiety or depression are um are most influencing you are that you're using the most and then we're only going to work with that. We're not going to just, you know, slavishly have to follow a long elaborate protocol. Let's, let's address those things directly. So it's very, in some ways, it's very streamlined um, and, um, and specific and targeted to this particular person and their particular maladaptive coping strategies. Well, yeah, the CCI, I think, would be something that would be helpful no matter what main, you know, therapeutic tool you use or, or, or it seems like it would just be very helpful to any clinician. Yeah. And it is available. It's, it's in the public domain. Um, if anybody wants to use it, um, it's at uh, www.newharbinger.com slash five Oh two one eight. That's how you get to it. And it's there. And, um, Eventually, in the next, probably in the next few months, we're going to set it up so that uh, it's, it can be scored automatically uh, and also percentiles will be provided so that, you know, when you get a certain score for one of these mechanisms, you can see how that relates to other people. You know, what percentage of other people have scored at this level. So you can so you, you get you get the actual score and then you get a, a percentile or a scaled score about how you, how your particular score relates to others. Um, So, yeah, but, but the, but the, the, um, the measure is there now and it can be downloaded and used. Okay. How was it, was this developed by uh, authors uh, who work at New Harbinger or was it a separate uh, entity that worked on this? No, it was um, developed. The original CCI was developed in 2007 by, um, Patricia Zarita Ona, who's one of the authors of the book. Um, and then it, it's been updated and revised numerous times. And the last iteration, the CCI 55 was, um, that research was done by Erica Poole, who's also an author of the book. Um, so it's not so much that New Harbinger is doing and New Harbinger is publishing the book, but, um, but these are people that have been all working together on, other iterations. Pat Fanning was also uh, wrote with uh, Patricia and I uh, the um, Mind and Emotions, uh, which is sort of an earlier version and uses an earlier version of the CCI. Uh, and and in that that book focuses on seven different mechanisms, uh, and and we completely revised that and, and dropped a number of them based on research, and then and then added. And, and, and many others. So, um, so this is based on the research of a lot of different people. Um, and, uh, it's kind of the culmination of about 20 years of, um, 
research and, and theorizing about, you know, what causes emotional disorders and trying to refine it and figure out, you know, you know, what are these specific mechanisms? And these, these are, and this is going to change, you know, 10 years from now, um, some of these mechanisms may not be uh, found to be quite as uh, predictive of emotional problems as we think now, and others will be added. Uh, For example, I I will say that originally we, you know, up until two years ago, we had 16 mechanisms uh, and we were using that in our, in our research and in our clinics. And, um, and we found that, you know, five of them really were not, were not really predicting, you know, who, who's having serious problems with anxiety and depression. And when we, and, and, we, and we were also finding that we weren't able to treat those mechanisms. They don't, the, the therapies we were using were not really making much change in those mechanisms. So we dropped them uh, because they don't seem really relevant. And, and so what I'm getting at is that as we, as, as time goes on, and as we continue to research process-based CBT and, and the mechanisms that cause emotional disorders and the processes that, that impact or, or treat or target those mechanisms, uh, we're going to, be continuously changing and what's also going to happen i mean for what it's worth is that name therapies are going to go away we're not going to call therapy cbt anymore or dialectical behavior therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy all of this is going to go away because it's because instead we're going to have we're going to have recognized mechanisms that are causing a lot of people's pain and we're going to have more and more processes research and effective processes that, that that target those mechanisms. So we're so all so the the growth is not going to be in you know I I cooked up this therapy and it's called blah blah blah. That, that, that's not where the, the development of the field is going. It's it's in it's in making specific uh, developing specific targeted change processes that that actually affect mechanisms. I, I I that's I welcome that because I think that that there is a you know well how many how many I think one rating or, or, or tally of, of therapies are over 400 therapies, out, psychotherapies out there. So some that have dropped off the face of the earth for the most part, I think like primal screen therapy, or, yeah, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> right? um, which of course, as, as you noted that the more anger you elicit in a person, the, the angrier their thoughts become and, and, and so on and so forth. It's not a way to, it's not a good way to uh, cathart. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but, but I do think, you know, the, uh, you know, the factor analysis of what makes psychotherapy works, right. Being the relationship and, and the strengths that you can elicit that are already existing in the client. Those are the two main factors, uh, that kind of meta analysis or, or meta perspective of therapy and the processes that make it work, I think are, certainly that's why I became interested in becoming a therapist. And I, I, I welcome this idea of looking for the mechanisms in any therapy that's out there, how it works, and maybe looking at a generalized category for where it falls into and teaching people how to do that at the right time in the right place in the right situation with a client. The trouble with these, exactly right. And the trouble with these um, named therapies is, that they only endorse a certain number of change processes. Each therapist therapy says, well, here's how we change psychological problems. Here's, here's how we treat people. And we're kind of limited if we're, if we, if we you know, work within a certain uh, framework, a certain kind of uh, named therapy, we're limited to the change processes endorsed by that therapy. And, and, and so what we're talking about with process-based CBT is like, we, we don't have to be limited. We can use any change process that works, that research tells us uh, is effective to, to help uh, and, ch- and change a certain mechanism. Now, let me give you an example. I mean, one, one of the things that we do in the book is we, we not only talk about change processes that reduce the use of the mechanism, you know, reduce rumination or reduce, say, blaming others or reduce uh, emotion avoidance. So we're looking at change processes that actually reduce the amount of time, time, the amount that people do that, the amount that they actually engage in those negative uh, um, mechanisms. Uh, 
But then we also look at how do we increase the other side of that? Uh, so, you know, if, if, for example, with emotion avoidance, okay, we can reduce to some extent emotion avoidance with certain kinds of treatments. But then how do we, cre- how do we increase emotion acceptance, the positive side of that? What, what change processes would help with that? And it turns out that there are certainly change processes in CBT, certain change processes in DBT, and uh, there are change processes in psychodynamic work that are all aimed at and targeting uh, reducing emotion uh, avoidance. But then we also want to start finding the change processes that increase emotion acceptance. And it turns out some of those change processes are more spiritually oriented. Um, For example, acceptance meditations, um, mindfulness meditations, about allowing an experience and watching and observing experience actually increases acceptance. So we can now not just borrow from any kind of therapy, any kind of name therapy that's ever been developed at change processes that, that are useful, but we can actually go into spiritual domains and spiritual practices and, and research and find out which of those uh, change processes would actually uh, not just reduce the use of the mechanism, but increase the positive side of that experience. So it gets very exciting. We can expand our, our, our psychotherapeutic world beyond not just the name therapies, but even beyond Western understandings of, of, of psychotherapy. Well, you know, um, Dan Brown, who is not, not the uh, novelist, but the uh, psychologist who was over at Harvard, who mm-hmm. was a long-term Tibetan meditation practitioner and, and interpreter of texts and a trainer, plus uh, very much involved in the hypnosis world and did a lot of work with attachment theory and, and attachment repair, um, helped with his team develop an integrative model. One thing he told me is that... Uh, in the Western models of psychotherapy, we're all about getting rid of the symptom or getting rid of the problem thinking. But the Eastern way of looking at things uh, is not to just get rid of the thought, but replace it with a positive. Yeah. So what you're talking about is like having to have, like, okay, so you have, you have these uh, limited, uh, potentially limited uh, thought processes that are negating your interaction with the world, the self and others. Right. And, uh, how do you how do you develop a more holistic way, positive way of looking at all of these things, which you know, spiritual traditions tend to do that? Absolutely, absolutely right, and um, and we're starting to learn about that. I mean, in, in many cases, you know, what's the so called third wave behavior therapy? A lot of mindfulness and Buddhist techniques and technologies have been drawn b- brought into. Uh, more traditional behavioral therapies and, and, and have transformed them. Um, and, and what you're saying is, is totally, seems totally right to me that uh, <clears throat> the Eastern approach is making room for experience, uh, l- learning to observe experience and make room for it rather than trying to get rid of it. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, in CBT and our, some of our Western approaches have been, we've got to get rid of that thought. We've got to get rid of that emotion uh, it, it hurts. It's, it's problematic. We're, we're going to change it. We're going to, uh, alter it. We're going to banish it. You know, years ago, uh, Joseph Wolpe came up with thought stopping. We'll, we'll get rid of that thought. Turned out it didn't work very well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll get rid of that thought. So we, we got very involved in trying to block, stop, redirect, control thoughts and a feel thoughts and emotions. Well, it, it seems like, it's, it's almost like all of the, you know, the third wave therapies and, and, and process the approach that process CBT is moving towards is more holistic, but it's also, it seems like a, a lot of what people were, were getting excited about within psychology, which would have been the second wave of Maslow's idea of self-actualization and the whole human potential movement and the transpersonal psychology movement that came out of that. It, it, what you're talking about is what they were working towards until everything became focused on, on problem oriented thinking and psychotherapy and psychology uh, versus, uh, you know, actionable items to get excited. You know, the brain is a really cool thing. The mind is a really cool thing. And, and you don't need to use these techniques to just kind of sit and process your problems and take care of them. 
which you can get stuck into. You can get stuck into a whole, I think you can get addicted to psychotherapy. You can get addicted to problem solving and fixing your life, right? Uh, and I think that it, we live in a society that is has a predilection towards that because we're all marketed to not feel good about ourselves and buy something, a pill or car or clothing that's going to make us feel sexier or better, be better in, in in conjunction with all of our social interactions and about ourselves. And I don't think that's, that's not where psychotherapy should be at. It should be allowing people room to breathe and to grow and expand their horizons. Like what they can do, enjoy being creative, spiritual creatures. Uh, exactly right. And the, the word is growth. Um, right. The old, I, you know, the more classic ideas uh, were about uh, fixing things. Um, even classic psychoanalysis is about fixing something. It's, it's about, um, you know, getting, you know, you know, helping people be less, um, influenced by unconscious processes trying, and trying to bring the unconscious in, into conscious awareness. So we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to fix you to the extent that we're going to help you, uh, recognize what's going on below the surface of awareness and uh, and uh, we're going to help you stop acting on defenses that are, you know, damaging your relationships and so forth. So there, even then, there was a lot of emphasis on fixing. And of course, uh, CBT has been even more so. It's like we're going to we're going to fix your feelings. We're going to fix your thoughts. We're going to change them. Um, <clears throat> and and there is some value in that. I, I think that in, in, when we're talking about super simple CBT, there's some the value in recognizing your thinking, noticing it, being aware of it, and recognizing when some of your thinking isn't helping you. And well, you know, you, you, you're, 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 I think what, you're hitting the nail on the head. It's, it's about metacognition, in a simple, more simple way of putting that, self-awareness of what you do and how you do it. Yes. And I, whether you're doing CBT, uh, cognitive therapy, psychodynamic, or client-centered, or ACT. What you're doing is you're allowing the people to be people to be more aware of what they're doing because no one has given us a user's manual for our brain, our mind, and our body. And the point you're making that really is important to me is that um, awareness is in the service not of getting rid of something, but can be in the service of growth. The, the more aware we are, the yeah. more potential we have for growth and for self-actualization. Uh, awareness is the doorway to, to helping us emerge fully as humans. And um, yeah. Yeah. so I, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I couldn't agree more that awareness is the key, not just to changing things that are not working, uh, but awareness is the key to enhancing and growing and developing our capacity for full engagement with life. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I think you're, you're saying it very well. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, that the worst thing that can happen for a person is they kind of go through life, not, not actualizing themselves or not, not taking up, the pen or the paper or the palette and the brush and creating themselves in life. Mm -hmm. Right. And in some way, shape or form, of course, you know, you can't not in a manic sense or a narcissistic, you know, pathological narcissistic sense, but like being able to kind of understand how we all are here to kind of co-create ourselves. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, this is an oversimplification, but I mean, again, this is sort of looking at things through a lens of acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, which is that, you know, we get involved in and we often get our whole lives are caught up in avoiding, uh, avoiding certain kinds of experiences, avoiding certain kinds of thoughts, um, avoiding certain kinds of pain. And and I see this a lot in our trauma clinic that people's people's lives that, you know, they've had a trauma, but now their, their life is, a, is, is really struggling with how can I avoid these feelings? How can I avoid these memories? How can I avoid th these emotions and this pain? And um, how can I avoid triggers in my everyday life that remind me of the trauma? And so, so life becomes about avoidance and that's not certain. It's not just trauma. That's really, I think something that a lot of us struggle with. And, 
it could be about something else. Our life could be about our values, you know, what we care about, what matters to us. Uh, the trouble is that when we move toward our values, we often do encounter pain. Uh, and so, and so we have to be willing to have some of that pain in order to do the things that really matter to us. Um, you know, let, I mean, let's just a, an example, let's say you have kind of a, a deep, uh, schema from childhood about, you know, a pathogenic belief that, that you're going to fail, that you're, you, you know, you don't do things well, that, uh, you're not, you're not good at stuff. And, and so now, but, but you have this value of producing, uh, some form of art and, uh, you know, whether it's, as you said, whether it's the palette or the pen or whatever it is, but you have a value. You want to, you want to turn your experience into, into something, something that, that, teaches people that has some beauty to it or whatever, whatever your goal is, but it, that your value is you want to produce art. Okay. But meanwhile, in order to move toward that value, you've got this, this old pathogenic belief, this old schema that you're going to fail and up comes anxiety. Uh, I'm going to screw up. People are going to judge me. People are going to see how bad I am at whatever this chosen art form is. Um, uh, I'm going to be embarrassed. I, I, I'm going to be ashamed and, and there's, there's, there's the prediction and expectation of very painful emotions and the fear of those emotions. And, and suddenly all movement toward the artistic um, expression comes to a halt. And that's what I mean when, you know, when, if we're going to move toward actualization, toward things that, you know, do deeply matter to us, uh, we are going to encounter certain kinds of pain. And, and being able to hold and accept that pain, allow that pain, while still committed to actualization, to, to, to the things that matter to us, is part of life. And, um, so, and, and, uh, and so I think I'm, I'm just kind of extrapolating from what you're saying that um, we're, it, it's not, you know, self-actualization is something that we do at a, at a certain price actually. Oh yeah. And, uh, it, it costs something. Uh, it's not just a direction we take, but it's a direction we take, uh, while also having to face and feel certain kinds of difficult emotions and, um, and the willingness to feel those emotions. We're going back to what we were talking about, uh, about emotion acceptance and emotion avoidance, the willingness to feel emotions, is almost a prerequisite for being able to move in valued directions. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right. Because uh, knowing what your values, what your values are, I find that many people don't even know what those are when I try to elicit them in, in a clinical session. Right. And, and of course those shift. So I haven't, you know, one of the nice things about working with the book is that what are my values right now? My values change over time. What do, what do I value right now? And what am I moving towards? You know, that kind of teleological stance that, that we all kind of have on some level. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we kind of emphasize in the book in terms of, you know, that, that first mechanism that we talked about of, of behavioral avoidance where people kind of get deactivated and they're, they're not, at, they're withdrawing from life in one way or another. And, uh, well, there's, and you mentioned, and you mentioned too, what's the other one is, is emotional reactance and behavioral activation, right? Those are the two main kind of, well, we talked about, you mean emotion driven behavior, uh, right, right, right. Emotion driven yeah. behavior and, and, uh, behavioral deactivation. Yeah. You know, this is behavioral avoidance. Yeah. Be, deactivation. Right. But those are, uh, they're almost opposite ends. <laughs> right. Although actually, Behavioral deactivation or behavioral avoidance is an emotion driven behavior because when you get depressed, you start withdrawing from life, which is, which is an emotion driven behavior. Right. Uh, and it results in, you know, a very constricted life. And what I was just going to say is that um, one of the most important ways that we can help people with behavioral avoidance is to clarify their values and to be aware of what really matters to them. What do you, what do you want your life to be about and how then can we build your values into your daily life? How can we make literally schedule things that matter to you, things you care about 
into your daily life so so that every day you're doing something that matters to you as opposed to just avoiding pain and 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 getting kind of stuck in deactivation so uh so yeah values show up in lots of different ways but that's one of the most important places where we want to help people uh get engaged with life is finding out what matters to them right well, yeah, and, and getting get engaged or self-actualized or whatever. In order to do that, you have to face pain. In order to do that, you have to face pain. Right. Exactly which, right. Which doesn't have to be all that painful. Well, we can help. We can, we can do th- two things. We can, we can, ma- we can make, so in some cases, we can make that pain less intense. And, and, that, and that's perfectly good goal to have. Um, but we can also help you increase your distress tolerance so that you, so that when pain comes along, you can, you can hold it, live with it and still do anything, do the things that matter to you, still move toward your values, still move toward actualization. Um, so we can do both. Uh, and, uh, and I think that needs to be the goal of therapy is that if, when we can reduce pain, by all means, let's, let's target that and, and work on it. Um, but, but you know, life is full of pain. You know, we can't get rid of pain. Life is, life is inherently we're, we're experiencing things that are difficult and, um, and, and inevitably we have emotions that don't feel good, uh, events that, that don't feel good. And so there's a certain amount of pain that's, that's, that's in, unavoidable in life. And so now what do we do with that? Uh, some pain we can we can manage we can reduce but some pain is just basically unavailable unavoidable and then the question going back to what we've been saying how can i hold that pain have that pain live with that pain experience that pain and still move forward and do things that matter to me and then that just becomes um the the goal of therapy i think in a way you know this is bringing to mind like you have to have a there's a, it's, it's basically a reward system, like the values, what's behind beyond the value being able to actualize that value or uphold that value, I think has a kind of reward to it in itself, right? An internal reward mechanism. Mm-hmm. And that would probably be what the reward is beyond feeling the pain or working through the pain or owning the pain, accepting it. I, I, I think that to me, that sounds exactly right. Uh, I think of that, I mean, this is a kind of a funny word to use, but I think of that reward as grace. It's almost a spiritual experience. It's, it's an experience of being on the right path of, of being, of living in alignment with your values. And there's this experience of grace and sometimes there's pain right next to grace. I mean, grace doesn't mean you don't have pain, but grace means that there's, there's a certain contentment that you are living the life that you are, that matters to you, even though, there's sometimes pain, even though there's sometimes, you know, stressors that are, are quite significant and impact you. Yes, all of that can be there. And still you can have grace of, li- of living in alignment with your values, moving toward actualization. And that's a profound experience. I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's its own emotion. Um, and, and it can live right next to the difficult pain of living, the unavoidable pain of living. It, it sounds like a very secure place to, in yourself to be. I think, you know, the only kind of happiness that we can hold on to that, that it endures is grace is the happiness that comes from living in alignment with our values. And lots of things happen to us in life that, that, that we can't control. Lots of losses, lots of struggles, mm-hmm. uh, threats, um, and, uh, hurts and, and the, the, that's, that's going to happen. That's going to show up. But, but the, there is a kind of happiness that, that it can endure and be sustained in the face of all of that. And that again is the happiness of grace of living in alignment with values. I think that's, that's where we have to go. Well, with, with that, like, what do you, where do you think things are going? You mentioned this kind of like at, at some point it's going to be, mechanisms of coping strategies and approaching them with various, it's going to be kind of this, this meta approach to how to approach problems in psychotherapy, no schools, 
only tools to uh, mm -hmm. yes. Borrow yes. Somebody, I like that. To borrow yeah. somebody from, I think Dr. Burns said something like that. David Burns said something like that, which is a kind of a cool idea. Yeah. But, uh, but where do you, th like you're, you're talking about spirituality. You think at some point there's going to be enough data points for the research minded oriented individuals to speak back to the clinically oriented of us to say, this is like, we're moving in this kind of spiritual uh, direction for psychotherapy and, and a personalized way of approaching it. Like, like, or is it something else? Where do you think things are going to go? Well, I think that's part of it. Uh, I, I think we're, we're moving in a direction in, in which we're going to, um, you know, target directly these maladaptive coping strategies and mechanisms. We're going to, we're going to, we have, we have lots and lots of change processes that reduce the use of those mechanisms. Um, we're going to have more and more change processes to increase and enhance um, uh, positive living. If I could just put it that way, or, um, you know, uh, you know, and values are just one change process. Values clarification is just one change process that um, is focused on the positive end. It's not about reducing a, ne a negative or a valid after coping strategies. It's about increasing our engagement with life. Um, and and we're, I think we're going to have more and more and more of those change processes that are focused on enhancing life as opposed to getting rid of problems. And, and that's where I think spirituality is going to come in more and more because spirituality really is not about fixing things. It's about um, engaging more fully with life. And, um, and, on, and in some ways also it's awareness. It's awareness that we're not just living in this little capsule of our body. We actually are connected to all of consciousness and, and we're not alone and, 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 we're, and we're here for a reason. And I, I think these kinds of ideas uh, that, that are inherently spiritual can actually start getting integrated into psychotherapy. I teach a class called psychotherapy and spirituality uh, that um, is surprisingly pretty popular. And, um, uh, and, and what the students, the grad students are looking for is how, how can I use spiritual practices in a, in a evidence-based spiritual practices in a way that, that can support my clients to have a better life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and I think we're going to do that. We're going to move toward that. And so spiritual practices are going to just be part of a whole group of change processes that are oriented toward improving and enhancing life as opposed to fixing problems. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of literature that's developing around mindfulness and other types of meditations. And there's an even older body of literature that's just waiting there. For, I, I'm waiting for a lot of people to rediscover it in the hypnosis literature about what the mind can do mm -hmm. and, and seeing how that kind of like uh, starts more of a conversation uh, between West and East, so to speak. Not that there's any delineation between east and west or whatever north south but but uh, or indigenous practices but like mm -hmm. finding what works and and actually looking at at the mind and, and seeing what people are capable of doing uh with that with this cool cool thing called the brain and the mind yeah well hypnotherapists know a lot about the mind that i think hasn't hasn't been fully integrated in our therapies. I, I agree with you, Scott. Yeah. I, and, and it is, it's rather sad and that it hasn't been, it'll eventually, you know, that light bulb will go off in a lot of people's heads, I think very soon. Uh, and you're right. Hypnotherapists know that. And, uh, but the literature has just, it's just a, a vast amount of literature on dissociation, absorption and hypnosis. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's touched upon it briefly in, in like Chick sent me high's idea of flow, which a lot of people are very mm -hmm. popular, popular, you know, popular psych idea, but it's also a very profound idea that can be utilized in uh, helping people grow in sessions. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And, 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 you know, fortunately we've run into these buzz saws like, uh, 
you know, false memory syndrome, Loftus oh. and, and, and well, that was a, that was a lot of that was a lot of the hypnotherapists' fault who were contributing to that problem. Yeah, yeah, back in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, but there's a lot a lot that we know about the mind from hypnosis that is still waiting to get into uh, yeah. stream psychotherapy. So I, I agree with you, and I think there's and, and frankly there's that's another whole area of change processes that, that come from hypnotherapy that we can start incorporating. Uh, you know, like what I do a lot with clients is, you know, when I'm doing cognitive rehearsal and we're rehearsing new behaviors, oh. we'll use hypnosis to, to, to visualize cool. the new behavior because it increases the chance that they'll actually be able to use it. Uh, uh, and, and, um, and, and the rehearsal is more effective. So, I mean, I, that's just a tiny, tiny little example of, of using uh, altered states uh, to enhance learning. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's, we have so far to go with that. I mean, it's just a, there's an infinite a number of possibilities for that, that we're just, you know, we're still kind of hesitating to look at because hypnosis is not fully gotten integrated. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Well, it will. I mean, it's just it's just waiting. It's just yeah. sitting around waiting in the academic halls and uh, the well, journal and articles. Part of, yeah. the, part of it is the, uh, um, frankly, the um, hostility of behavioral therapy toward hypnosis and um, and it's the word. It's just the word. It has a, it has a, a stigma. But but as behavioral therapy and these named therapies begin to become less and less significant, and and what is significant is, you know. Uh, change processes and, 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 yeah. and, you know, of all kinds from all schools, uh, including spirituality, as this becomes more important, uh, we're going to start turning to hypnosis and say, well, what change processes do you guys have uh, that, that can help us? Yeah. 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 It's all, it's all pretty much codified <laughs> yeah. and, and just ready there for people to start looking through it. And, oh, this would work. This would be lovely. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, I, it's time, it's time will come at some point. Things come and go, you know, trends wax and wane. So like the moon. So, all right. Well, maybe on that note, we can uh, look towards the future and uh, uh, sign off. I, Dr. McKay, you came here about a month ago or we met each other a month ago and I had a technical difficulty with my, my zoom proficiency and uh, you were kind enough and gracious enough to come back and forgive me for that technical snafu. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. And I, I believe that the audience out there listening in will appreciate it. And uh, what are the two books? Uh, super simple CBT and uh, uh, the healing emotional pain workbook. Okay. Yeah. And they are available in brick and mortar stores and online everywhere. And they're from new Harbinger press. Is that correct? That's right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. McKay. Thanks so much, Scott. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the psychology talk podcast. Did you know you can find us on the web all over the place? Well, maybe not all over the place, but you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, loads of places. Please look for us. And if you can, subscribe, like us, leave us a review, send us a comment, a criticism. Hey, we like to hear a lot from people. Go ahead. Talk to us. That's why we're here. By the way, this is just a reminder to let you know that all of the material here is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you do need a therapist or a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati.